Is singing rock like singing opera? What a strange question. It should be, but for the most part it's not, unless you're doing Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy, which I trained bel canto as the foundation and the basic tenets for being able to sing pop or rock. But let me explain a couple things. First off, in bel canto, in opera, there is a wonderful mechanism, support mechanism, and understanding how to grow your vowel sounds in such a way that it makes rock sustainable. Most rock singers lose their voice right away because they don't understand this concept. So no, rock isn't like singing opera, but it should be. Let me show you what I mean. If you have an opera singer, and let's say you're a soprano, and let's say you're singing uh, an uval, all right? And I'll just sing a, you know, a, a D5 uval. Okay, I went from piano to forte to piano. Now, if a rock, I, right? A rock guy, if he's smart, will understand the concepts of bel canto to be able to sustain that kind of sound. So let's do this a little higher. Let's do an ah vowel. Right, that's a good uh, operatic, um, operatic ah vowel. Now I wanna get into coloration in a minute and, and coloring a sound or darkening a sound or covering a sound. We'll talk about that, that in a second. But let's talk about a rock eye. Right? He should really understand the concept of how to get that vowel placement clean and safe even before he distorts a sound. We always train clean. We never, dist we never train distortion. We work distortion later, that comes later when we sing, and, and then we always come back and clean up the sound with a clean sound, or we forever sentence ourselves to a dirty sound, period. That's a, a non-negotiable thing. But the reason I bring this up is, is that as we train as rock singers, we should be training like operatic singers. The difference is, is in opera, um, there are character voices and it's called vocal fox, F-A-C-H-S. It's a German system that was designed to cast characters in a play. So you're dramatic, you know, you're sobre, which is light and airy. You're, you know, th there's all these different categor categorizations, categorizations. Um, and so they would categorize something so they could fill a role, you know? So she's young, she's agile, she's, you know, blah, blah, blah. She's sobre, or he's the villain, so he's gonna be dramatic or something else. So they have these different cl uh, classifications for singers. The problem is, is that once someone is cast into a role, it's really difficult to get them out of that role and into playing a different role once they're seen that way. Kind of like a lot in the movies and acting, the bad guy is usually always the bad guy, right? And they always cast him in that scene. So very similar to, to opera and to Broadway and to, you know, um, um, to arias. But the reason I bring it up is, is that bel canto trains dark covered vowel sounds, okay? Um, so we can't use the total all of the tenets of, of bel canto because first off, they never want you to distort a sound, okay? Understandably, it's bel canto, beautiful singing. They're not looking for distorted singing. Um, they also only have five vowel sounds, a, e, e, a, and u, right, in the Latin. So there's only five vowels. English language has around 16 with dip, diphthongs as many as 32 or more. Um, but anyway, so, so you train these vowels. So let's go through a, a, a series of vowels. If I go, uh, U, O, A, A, and E in opera for, for a baritone, it would sound like this. La, O, I, right? That would be a typical thing that you would learn to sustain a sound and understand how to cover a vowel sound or darken a sound or keep it true bel canto. To contemporize that sound, if you're a rock guy, you would go, La, and you're gonna bring it in the face, bring a little mask into the sound and brighten it up. But the interesting thing is, I'm gonna do them both back to back. And I want you to hear how both of them actually have the same placement of the vowel in the back of the throat. The only difference is the coloration in the face and bringing the sound a little more far, farther forward. Listen, I'll do the bel canto again. Hear how covered or darkened that sound is? 
But notice the vowel was still ha 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 he. Didn't change much, and it was the same round tubular sound of the vowel. Now listen to contemporizing the vowel. La. All I did was bring the sound a little farther forward and didn't darken or color the sound as much as bel canto, okay? So if a rock guy is smart, he will learn this concept and understand how to utilize this wonderful, incredible mechanism for singing and contemporize that into rock so that he or she doesn't lose their voice. Now, let's talk about something else. When Pavarotti goes to sing Nason Dorma and he hits, the B at the end, vincero. And he goes, vincero. And he hits that note, okay? That note is one of the highest notes, though he, Pavi does sing higher notes too. But this is typically the high note at the end of an aria or the end of a night, you know, a, 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 an evening at the opera. Um, the, and so the tenor high C is only one, vincero. It's one note higher, okay? Now, the female soprano uh, high C is the octave of that. Okay, it's way up there. So that's the, the high note for the soprano. What's different for guys and girls is that the guys were all trained for the money note to hit the B4 or the C5 in a belted chest sound. But their whole range is predominantly a chest resonant sound, a big, robust, what we call the call register, hey, you know, a big belted sort of sound. Whereas most sopranos are trained, and you even see this like, you know, in Nightwish and some of these other bands where, you know, a, a lot of this implementation of opera is being used in rock, their chest voices are kind of wimpy. You know, it's not like Lizzie Hale or Pat Benatar or, or one of my students, Gabriela Gunchikova or whomever, or, or, or Sarah Luera. They're, they're not, they've never been trained in opera, in fact, they've been trained against over singing the bottom of their chest voice, their belted call register, because the concern and only concern of a maestro or a composer was for the money note, the C6, the high note. So they sacrificed at the altar of that high note to atrophy or weaken or not really train the female soprano lower register. Now altos are a little different sometimes, but not much, but the altos are different because sometimes they do have more of a belting register. The reason I bring this up, ladies, is if you're out there and you say, you know, he's right. When I was in choir or when I was taking voice or in college or whatever it was, they never trained me to sing with a robust belted sort of sound in my mid voice because they were predominantly concerned with me singing the C6, the high C. So at Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy, we say, no, 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 no. We want to train your chest voice to be the foundation that holds up that high C so you have a powerful register at any registration in your voice, not just at the high notes. It's also true for the guys. Rarely do you sing Pavarotti go, tiptoe through the tulips, won't you come with me? And, you know, they don't have that falsetto register because they were not developed because their robust Vincero. That one note was the note they were taught to sing and not necessarily go beyond that with a head voice sound. But that also is problematic because then that's the zenith or the limit or ceiling of their range. So, right, we want to be able to train that upper uh, belting register to go into the head voice register, match the tonal qualities of our head voice register to get a lot more range out of the male tenor or baritone voice, okay? So the question was, is rock singing like opera singing? It isn't, but it should be, all right? Definitely stick around and check out my next video.